Good day, I'm Martin Gago with Market Radius Research. It's Thursday, January the 19th, and we've got CEO Chris Moreau of Algernon Pharmaceuticals joining us today. Algernon is a clinical stage drug development company investigating safe and already approved drugs for new indications. Algernon has put out a good flow of news release of late, and we're here to put them into context and provide an update. But please remember, this is neither recommendation nor investment advice. We're here to learn about the company. Chris, thank you very much for joining us. You have been busy, lots of uh, programs on the go here. Why don't we um, uh, start off with the uh, AP 188? Uh, your DMT program, and right. uh, you've had a bit of news of that. Why don't you, what's going on there? Pro probably the, the biggest news is that, uh, and we announced this about a month ago, that we created a private subsidiary called Algernon Neuroscience, and we've transferred all of the DMT stroke program assets into that subsidiary. And uh, I was just thinking before our uh, interview today that uh, this is really maybe, really maybe the first time I can go into a little bit of detail. And, and that's really what I, I see your uh, program about. It's, it's getting behind the scenes. So I, I did have a few uh, psychedelic funds over the last few months say to me that they loved our DMT stroke program, but they didn't like that we were a public company because they don't invest in public companies. And I'll tell you why in a moment. And they also wanted, if they were going to invest, they wanted to make sure that the money they invested went to the DMT stroke program. And if they invest up at Algernon Pharma, the public company, uh, how do we make sure that those funds are for what they want? So they weren't really big fans of having multiple programs, which is what Algernon has. So um, as you know, Algernon Pharma today has a market cap of about five to six million. It's really not reflective of the two lead programs we have and reflects really the capital markets are in rough shape and it's not just Algernon. So, we created that subsidiary and vended in the assets so that we could assign what we think is a fair market value for the program. We've invested about four to five million and it started a phase one study. So we've said, look, Algernon Neuro, in our view, $20 million valuation US and um, uh, investors in Algernon will, should be smiling because within Algernon Pharma, it doesn't have that level of, of value. And then the second step is to go out and raise about 10 million in the subsidiary uh, to provide the capital to make sure we can get to the end of a phase two study. So there's lots on the go. In order to raise money in Algernon Neuro, which is now a private company, which is a subsidiary of Algernon Pharma, We've applied for what's known as a Reg A financing, Regulation A with the US SEC. It allows for digital and online marketing globally and basically allows us to access a different type of investor, not your classic stock, uh, uh, stock market investor, but millennial investors that punt from the two to 3,000 range. They can use uh, uh, Visa, MasterCard, Apple Pay, there's an online application process. So that was the reasoning behind it. We wanted to free it up. And I just want to add one more thing. What By insulating it in the subsidiary, then uh, with good phase two data from a stroke program, we, we think that we're, we're talking about an asset that could be in the hundreds of millions of dollars of value. And uh, we could look at doing a direct IPO with Algernon Neuro. Neuro. Uh, science. So we've got an exit strategy in mind too. So it's a bit of a change. Investors have a chance to get in on the private equity that'll be available soon. It bolsters their investment in Algernon Pharma. So that's some some good background. Okay, that, that's an interesting strategy, especially, yeah, we're in the middle of, of quite, uh, winter has come for the, uh, the, uh, the biotech industry, given evaluations all around. And then if you, let's say, raise 10 million, that in essence gives what a 30% dilution on Algernon Neuro, while if it was done in Algernon Parent, it, that would be like 150%. It, it would sort of just wipe out the uh, cap table. Not only wipe it out, I think it's it's a quantum that's unachievable. Yeah. I'd raise 10 million with a five, $6 million market cap. So you, 
you did mention um, like with the reggae filing, but you, you talked with VCs or, or biotech uh, specialists. Presumably that would be part of the plan as well then that um, uh, that other, the, the more sophisticated uh, hedge fund or specialty funds could then have an opportunity to, to invest directly into this. Right, right. and so we, we're, we'll wait till we get that reggae approval yeah. Then we'll go out and specifically we'll be pitching some psychedelic funds that are in the space. So they like the story. They didn't like the fact we were public. Well, now it's private. And if they invest, they know the funds are going directly to develop the DMT program. We'll also pitch uh, VCs. There are uh, funds in the U.S. that don't, they like private equity. Yeah. So they don't. Uh, and so that's a different animal. So we'll be pitching funds as well as uh, creating a digital online marketing program to attract that classic reggae investor. There have been billions of dollars raised through Regulation A in the last uh, number of years. And uh, it's really an exciting new avenue. It's the first time for us. So uh, I'm, I'm quite excited about it. And we've, we're developing quite a nice digital online program that will um, explain the opportunity to investors and the, the fact that we could have good phase two a data within about a two year or 20 month period. That's, that's really exciting. That's pretty fast. Can you just give us a quick update on the, um, the, the your first patient was dosed in the Netherlands or what, one or two weeks ago. Can you just quick review yeah. on, on what to expect with uh, timing and, and, and data and news flow regarding that program? Sure. So to remind everybody, uh, the DMT stroke program, DMT is a naturally occurring psychedelic drug called NN dimethyltryptamine. The preclinical data is suggesting that it helps brain neurons uh, grow. It's called neuroplasticity to create new neural pathways. This is a mechanism that's involved when you have an injury to the brain, like a stroke. And DMT increases a growth factor in the brain called BDNF brain-derived neurotrophic factor. So this is all the data we see. And finally, there was a good stroke animal study that showed when rats were uh, injured uh, in a stroke model, given DMT, that the rats almost had a full recovery of motor function and a smaller area of damage in the brain. And keep in mind, when you've had a stroke, you have a deficit after typically, you might have cognition issues, sight, sound, hearing. You might have motor function. And the data is showing that uh, DMT is helping the brain to heal. And the other interesting point, not at a psychedelic dose. So at a sub-psychedelic level, and I think that's intuitive. If you've had a stroke, you've had an injury, state of confusion, you don't have a spirit guide. So giving somebody that experience, uh, not that good. So sub-psychedelic is what we're focused on. So um, we're running a phase one study. First patient was dosed. Uh, patients actually a few days ago, we're delivering DMT intravenous. That's the best way to get a drug in the body. You bypass the gut, the liver called first pass, and you can bring up their level very quickly. So we'll do a bolus injection. If anybody's been in the hospital on an IV, the nurse comes in and can give you a drug very quickly. That's called a bolus dose. Then through a drip, we'll be holding patients at a sub-psychedelic level for about six hours. And that's the first part of the study. Second part, the patients will come back, get a six-hour dose every two days for a period of a week. So this will inform us um, three things we want to know about DMT. What's the right dose? How close can we get to the, that psychedelic uh, dose, which is about two milligrams per kilogram? What's the duration? How long can we treat them? And then how soon can we treat them once they arrive at the hospital? When you're suspected of having a stroke and you get to the emergency, they need to figure out, do you have a bleed or a blockage? Because we treat them differently. Yeah. The sooner we can start delivering DMT, we think based on the data, the better off that patient outcome is going to be. That study should wrap up sometime in June or July. We get the data. We're already planning the phase 2A. This is where we get a chance now to test the drug in patients that have had a stroke. We'll focus on ischemic stroke patients, about 85% of people that have an ischemic stroke, that's a blockage. And 85% of that group have no treatment. They're simply sitting in the ICU under watchful waiting. 
only about 15% of stroke victims, ischemic stroke victims, can either get a very high powered blood thinner or mechanical removal of the stroke. So it's a massive need. We'll give them DMT and a placebo, look at their outcome after 30 days, and we hope we'll have some really good data. So the endpoints on the, right now, you're, you're dosing healthy patients, not stroke victims. That's and right. what are the endpoints? Is it just safety and then sort of, oh, we gave a little too much, they're, they're seeing things, yeah, so to they're, speak? They're, and right, right. So this is an ascending dose study. So Dr. Rick Strassman, author of the book, The Spirit Molecule DMT, he did his studies in the 90s and, and confirmed that about 0.2 milligrams per kilogram is the psychedelic dose. It's a bit different with people. We're going to bring them up to that dose in various ascending doses. And we have a psychiatrist that sits with the patients after we've treated them. And uh, we want to establish what we consider to be that MTD, maximum tolerated dose, not by safety, but by experience. Are they starting to see visual aura or sights or sounds because that hallucination process is multivariate? It's not just one experience. Once we establish the maximum dose below the psychedelic range, um, then it will inform us uh, as to the dose, the concentration. Then the second, we want to hit that sigma one receptor. That's what DMT hits when it gets into the brain. We want to saturate those receptors to boost BDNF. So do we treat them for one hour, six hours, 24 hours, four days? We'll learn some of that in this phase one, which is healthy patients only. That will inform us for our phase two, where we can do multi-dosing, different durations, placebo with folks that have had a stroke. So that's the plan. All right. And DMT, that is a naturally occurring molecule. What are you doing to ensure that you have like you're not spending your dollars to uh, so other people can uh, sort of profit from this. How, great, how, how... great question. And we're in the same spot or we were as all these other companies that are in the psychedelic space, psilocybin, psilocin, these are all naturally occurring compounds. There's four ways to protect yourself in this situation. One is called a method of use patent. That drug to treat that disease, we lost that benefit when the uh, Hungarian group published the data that DMT helps strokes in rats. So we lost that. Second would be dosage. So we have filed dosage patents for microdosing. Third would be a formulation. There's nothing novel in this case about an intravenous dose before we delivered um, a DMT, our study. It had already been uh, formulated as IV. The fourth is you can make a change to the molecule. It's called a derivative or an analog. Yeah. And um, what happens if you're not careful, typically when you change an, uh, the molecule, it's, it's a new molecule, a new entity under the FDA. You have to go right back to, to preclinical, start all that talks work again, because you've made a change, enough of a change that, in fact, it could be toxic and you have to explore that. A lot of time and cost. Another ingenious approach is called the changing the salt. Now, about 50% of prescriptions that all of us get over the counter, sorry, not over the counter, but prescriptions are in a salt form. You've got the core structure of the molecule and you attach a salt to it. The salt can make the drug more soluble. It can help it become easier to manufacture. It might even make it more efficacious. You can switch out the salt without changing the core molecule, but it's still considered a new composition of matter. So our uh, chemist team came up with two new salts, pomoic and nicotinic, that have never been disclosed, so they're novel. We filed for these new salt forms. The U.S. Patent Office uh, did their review, concurred that they were novel and patentable. So we're uh, proceeding with those patents. So basically, we would get a 20-year composition of matter on our new form of DMT. Well, wow, all right. That, that's, uh, that seems like you got a good uh, strategy uh, to deal with that there. You've also got the uh, NP120 program doing. Why don't we maybe uh, circle back uh, shortly next week and we can get an update on there, bring investors up to speed on those programs. Great. Looking forward to it. And thanks for, uh, for the time today. All right. Thanks a lot, Chris. Okay.